more than 2,000 years ago, a light came into our world. This light sacrificed itself in love for humanity, and in doing so, many others bore this light. Those who received this light found joy in sharing it, and it soon began to spread around the world. All throughout history, there have been many who have tried to snuff it out. Many bearers of this light faced persecution and painful struggles. Yet, the light continues to illuminate. This light traveled to many places, and one fine day, found its way to the shores of Singapore. A young missionary, Father Laurent Arbert, reported to his superior bishop Florence in 1821 that he had encountered a small community of Catholics on the island, 12 or 13 in number, and they seemed to live a wretched life. Father Arbert recommended that a missionary presence be established on the island. He then went on to China and Korea, eventually becoming Korea's bishop. Just at that time in Korea, there was a severe persecution of Christians. The rulers in Korea made a deal. If the bishop surrendered himself, the Christians would be spared. He surrendered to the authorities. Then there were two more priests, also living in hiding. Abbey wrote to them and said, you better surrender to the police as well, in order to spare the persecution of our people. He quoted St. John, the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. So they also surrendered, and uh, one month later, three of them were beheaded. Father Ambert was martyred in 1839. That very same year, a young 26-year-old by the name of Father Jean-Marie Borel landed on Singapore's shores. He took charge of the Catholic community and obtained a piece of land on Brass Bassa Road to build a new church. When Burrell started building the church, he and Bishop Bouchot chose the name of Good Shepherd in memory of Bishop Ambert. So the church in Singapore has been connected with someone who gave their life for Christ. In the early days, this was the first and only church, and it is today the oldest Catholic church in Singapore. What is the meaning of this building? What was it for? First and foremost, to provide for the spiritual needs of the early immigrants that came to live in Singapore. Wherever there were Catholics, the French MEP fathers would reach out to them. Upon Father Borel's request, Father Monduy built a chapel in 1846 in the plantations of Kranji. That area used to be a very large majority of the Chinese coolies and immigrants went to work. And so you come on a boat, as soon as they step off the boat, they are inducted into secret society. But then the missionaries came along. They started preaching about love, about God, about what it means to be part of a family. I think that was a big thing, to be part of a family of God. Those secret societies were controlling all those people coming from China and also getting money from them. But those who became Christians escaped, you know, from their control. These good Christians are not smoking opium, they're not gambling. So the Hueys waited until the priests were out of town one day and they attacked. They set fire to the villagers, they looted it. Reports say that 500 Christians were killed in the riot. The newspapers termed it as the anti-Catholic riot. But that didn't deter the Catholic Church from growing. In fact, we grew in bigger numbers. And so, the Church continued its work, despite persecution from the secret societies in 1851. At the other end of the island, the need to bring light to the Aukang farmers led to the building of another chapel in 1852 that was later renamed the Church of the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. However, with more locals bearing the light, the need to serve the different ethnic groups became more pressing. Singapore, with its famous 
multi-ethnic nature. We had to contend with different languages. As most of the people then could not speak English, the missionaries had to pick up the various languages to serve the various communities here. If I want to reach out the people of Singapore, I must speak the lingua of Singapore, and I must be part of the life of people in Singapore. Christ remained 30 years as a carpenter and preached three years. Why did he waste 30 years as a carpenter? To be rooted in his own Jewish situation. And then he spoke the language of the people. At that time, there was only one church in town, eh? the very good shepherd, and all the services were in Latin. But the preaching was done in English, or sometimes Portuguese or Malay. But the Chinese, there was nothing for them. And the Indians, the same. They didn't speak English. As soon as they got some money, they built St. Peter and Paul. And so, Malay and English remain in the Good Shepherd, Chinese and Tamil went to St. Peter and Paul. 1888, another piece of land was bought in Ophir Road and the Church of Our Lady of Lutz was built to take care of the Tamil-speaking Catholics. Further on, the Church again of the Sacred Heart was built to take care of the dialect-speaking Cantonese group. And then years later, the Church of St. Teresa's was built to take care of the Hokkien and Hakka-speaking people. In 1932, the Chapel of the Holy Family was set up to cater to the growing Eurasian community in Katong. So anybody thinks somewhere in Katong, if you were Chinese, you were told straight away, you go to Queen of Peace, that's your church. It's interesting, I suppose, in the sense that they've segregated themselves according to the language and the dialect groups of the day. But they could not carry on that way, you see. So the bishop decided to remove from linguistic parishes to territorial parishes. It was Archbishop Olsamendi who set in place the move to territorial parishes. Bishop Olsamendi became a bishop from a parish priest. He was parish priest of Our Lady of Lourdes. What I heard him say is that uh, the parishes must not be too big because if they are too big, you have no more time for the non-Christian. And that's the reason why he erected 18 parishes. So he started with uh, Our Lady Star of the Sea, then Immaculate Heart of Mary, then Queen of Peace, and then St. Francis Xavier, St. Bernadette, OLPS, St. Ignatius, and all these parishes built one after the other. More so than the light that led to the building of physical churches was the light that sparked in the hearts of the people. After building the first church, Father Burrell was convinced that the church needed to provide education especially for the poor. The missionaries had a great insight. They realized the value of education. Father Burrell felt that we needed an English mission school because the rest of the Portuguese Catholics were sending their children to Protestant schools. He tried at all within his means to get the brothers here and it wasn't easy. He wrote many times to Rome and to the Brother Superior General and he was not one to sit back and just wait for replies. So that's why he went back again to Europe to make sure that he would travel with the brothers and the sisters and come down to Singapore. Six brothers and four IG sisters on the ship, the La Julie. Three months on a ship is not easy. In fact, there was a story of one of the sisters. She died uh, two weeks before they reached Singapore. Very soon after arrival, the first thing they did was to open schools. It wasn't to propagate the faith, but it was to see how they could make society better by providing education. In the first years, SGI at Braspasa. At that time, SGI was known as St. John's Free School because education was to be provided free. SGI was started in 1852 by the LaSalle brothers. It was situated diagonally opposite the cathedral, where the current Singapore Arts Museum occupies. For the IG sisters, Father Burrell forked out his own money 
to pay for a piece of land across the cathedral to build them a convent. With the second batch, we had Mother McTeel, and she had the inspiration to start the education for girls. Within 10 days, she started already gathering the poor girls and the school began. When this place was really dilapidated, they had a house over there, not like that now. There was no door. They had to use an umbrella for privacy. Two pots, two pans and things like that. Very hard times, but they persevered and went on. That's why it's the courage, daring spirit that touched me. They managed to get the piece of land that is where the current, what is now known as Chimes. It is from there that the IJ school started out, with the very first one in Victoria Street. When we came here to Singapore, we accepted children of any background. We didn't only bring in Catholics. Children from every background came to the school and we were accepting. Openness to other religions have always been the hallmark of IJ. So it was from these two lights that many more Catholic schools came to be built. These lights came from stars like the Good Shepherd Sisters, the Maris Brothers, the Gabrielite Brothers, as well as the Canossian Sisters. In the year 1894, the Bishop of Macau felt that the parish in Singapore needed help. So it, from Macau came four sisters to start off St. Anthony's and St. Anthony's Convent. Father Stephen Lee, he wanted to start a school for the poor children of the Kampong area. So he bought this land and he asked the sisters, you know, to start the school and the orphanage. The orphanage flourished more and more. Girls who were in need of schooling, in need of help, were given that opportunity which they didn't have. And later on, we started a school for hearing impaired children which later on became the notion school for the hearing impaired. The Catholic Church would be the single biggest uh, contributor of education in society. We cater to every sector of the student body. Catholic education is about helping the person to be the best that he or she can be and to contribute back to society. Following fast on the heels of education, orphanages were being set up in convents and parishes to take care of the little ones who were being abandoned. Word got around that the sisters would actually pick up any abandoned babies that were placed at their gate. It became known as the Gate of Hope. I remember there were about 100 orphans. 120 of them. 120 orphans. The sisters had great psychology by inviting those of us who studied in the schools to ask us to come to give them hugs, to actually hug the babies and give them love. I, I was one of them. I was in the school and every recess time, I would sacrifice my recess and went to the baby house. Played with them, fed them, and I brought my friends along. Then we have a sister who would be just washing nappies, but she does it with such joy, and everything she does is for the love of God. What is important is really to recognize that really it's God who calls, and it's God who always inspires. It's living your faith that you touch the people. Orphanages were also set up in the compounds of churches like St. Peter and Paul and the Sacred Heart. The Catholic Church also started to see the need to bring God's light to the sick. One fact that is little known about the IJ sisters is in the late 1800s, the colonial government approached the IJ sisters to manage Singapore General Hospital. They were lacking in nurses. And for us, wherever there's a need, we respond. As Singapore grew to be an important port in the region, it became a light to many who saw hope for a brighter future. In the 1920s, there was a huge influx of people from China who were running away from the persecution there. Father Stephen Lee took pity on them. He wrote to the government and said, could you give us a place that these Chinese can settle in? He was so persuasive, they were allocated this piece of land, which subsequently became known as the Catholic Village. And this is where today's Stephen Lee Road is situated. They built up the community. Eventually, there was a church that was built there, and that is the Church of St. Anthony. In the 1930s, 
Bishop Duval took charge of the church and immediately saw the need to invite other missionaries to serve the people of Singapore. He invited the Good Shepherd Sisters. There were four of them. He learned to speak Cantonese, to communicate with the girls, and also taught them English. And they were there until the war broke up. On 15th February 1942, Singapore surrendered to the Japanese. When the war broke out, the house was bombed. During the Japanese occupation, the physical buildings will become bomb shelters. In St. Peter's and Paul nearby, whenever the bomb siren sounded, then the people from around all ran to the church and hide in the basement. When I was a teacher in Manfred School, only in a sense, I asked the boys to write the, the saddest day in their life. Out of 40 boys in my class, 22 of them, their father's head, had been cut off. They were sent to the camp in Bahau. It was too dangerous to stay in Singapore. Several hundred Catholics were relocated to Bahau. The conditions were harsh. Many did not survive, including Bishop Duval. Amidst the hardship and suffering, the light still shone through, and the church persevered to serve the people of Singapore. During the war, Brother Vincent and Brother Francis were prisoners of war. And Brother Vincent was with an Australian person. He said, if we come out of this prison camp, and Brother Vincent, I would like to build a home for the children whose parents were killed during the war. So, Voice Town for us is important because the aim of Voice Town was to come to the rescue of all those who failed in life. We wanted to give them a second chance. So we go and fetch them from down below and lift them up to what they are today. In the 1940s, while many Singaporeans lived in the darkness of the slums, suffering from diseases like tuberculosis and leprosy, the expulsion of Catholic missionaries in China found a need for their service in Singapore. In 1948, China, in a civil war, communists took over the country. Within a few years, they expelled every single missionary out of China. It was a massive trauma for the church. But as a result, they established new centers in Tokyo, in Manila, in Singapore, you know, many other areas in Southeast Asia. So, the church in Southeast Asia, in a way, benefited, but with a great loss from China. The bishops in China said to the sisters, no, we don't want you, you have to go. Because he was trying to protect them. He didn't know what the communists were going to do. And so they were invited to come down, specifically to look after the tuberculosis patients of Tan Tok Seng, because no one wanted to do that job. Mother Angela, Sister Camillus, and Sister Baptista. They were the first three. A lot of nurses wouldn't want to work in TB hospitals because they're afraid of uh, being contagious. I have actually worked in the tuberculosis place, but we never think that we all mustn't touch this, mustn't... No, we act normally. They did such a fantastic job that they were also given care of the leprosy patients. They started out serving so well again that the government said, could you start training girls to do this job? They were the first ones who started this training centre for nurses. In 1961, the sisters built the first Catholic hospital in Singapore, Mount Alvernia Hospital. The Franciscan missionaries of Divine Motherhood Sisters had that dream to build up a Catholic hospital to reach out to more patients. Mount Alvernia was opened in 61. For the first year or so, the whole place was run by sisters. We didn't have any nurses. We couldn't pay for staff to begin with because um, we didn't have the money. So we did everything. You know, even patients in the morning, wake them up, wash them, and then bring their breakfast in, then wash the dishes after that, and then clean the floors, clean the rooms. The beauty of it was whether you were a patient in a private room or two-bedded, 
or an eight bed, it made no difference to the way we treated them. And the food is the same. The food is know. the same, and the sheets, remember the embroidered yeah, sheets? Embroidered sheets. And all the beds were the same. And we embroidered them. We were willing because we we're happy to have at last a hospital. Nursing is a profession, and it's a calling. Over the years, many different religious orders, such as the Little Sisters of the Poor and the Brothers of Mercy, came and attended to the disadvantaged of society. Light begets light. In the 1950s, many Catholics were encouraged to reach out to the poor and needy. This saw the formation of the Catholic Welfare Services, St. Vincent de Paul Society, Young Christian Students Movement, and other Catholic action groups. In the 1950s and 60s, there were many poor in Singapore living in the kampongs and slums. The Vincentians took up the call and they walked the track roads to the kampongs to make home visits to serve the poor. In order to address the charity needs of our people, Catholic Welfare Services was set up. You have people like Dr. Yi Peng Liang, who was very instrumental in the early days of Catholic Welfare Services, to canvas for funds. And they started by just giving rations and money at the church premises. In the old days, many families wanted their children to go out to work, to help them do fishing, to help them do the vegetation plantation. I think the church knows that education is a very important way out of the poverty trap. So those days was, please let your children go to school. But the definition of poor in Singapore is evolving. There are many people who have got relative poverty. They have the basic necessities, but they lack that social resources that will help them upgrade. Even though today we may not have so many orphans, but we have children from disadvantaged families, sometimes one parent in prison. Now the need to bring social services to the people led to homes like St. Vincent's Home, St. Teresa's Home, as well as Catholic Welfare and Social Service Centres to be the new lights of society that reached out to all. The Church is here to serve everyone, not only the Catholics. We want to make Singapore a better place. We want individuals to be cared for, to be respected. Every Christian is called to practice charity. In fact, Pope Benedict says that charity is the heart of the church. Sister Elizabeth and Sister Magdalena, they used to tell us, when you go to visit the poor, you are bringing Jesus to them. And you also find Jesus in them. The Catholic Church was also quick to respond when disasters hit Singapore, like the Bukit Ho Swee fire in 1961. The Francis Mission of Mary Nuns found that there was a need to provide some space for the children and the youths who are living in one room flats. If there's no space at home, where do they go? They go to the streets. That area has been notorious for gangsterism, and so they rented a two-room flat. And when they started this program, it was called Nazareth Centre. It is in the darkest places in Singapore that the missionaries would bring the light. I've been in the prison ministry for 35 years. God called me to walk with death row inmates. And you know what's the most beautiful thing? When I kneel there and they go up to the trap door and I'm singing their favourite song and I hear the trap door, I know that God in His mercy has taken them up to himself. I'm always with them right to the very end. And I tell them, when they uncuff you after, they bring you down, I will close your eyes in bed and I will put the rosary in your hand. I think that's what we have to do. <laughs> we just have to be lights in our own small way. It's the light of God in us. Prior to 1972, the church was part of the Diocese of Malacca, Singapore. 
because the Catholic population in Singapore was growing to such huge numbers, the decision was made to have Singapore as a separate archdiocese by ourselves. And that only took place in 1972. Michael Olsenmendi retired in 1976 as Archbishop of Singapore. He was succeeded by Archbishop Gregory Yong, the first local clergy to lead the church. Archbishop Yong reorganized and restructured the church to allow greater interaction between the laity and the clergy for the management and spiritual development of the church in Singapore. In 1981, Diplomatic ties were established between Singapore and the Holy See, and this subsequently led to Pope John Paul II's visit to Singapore in November 1986. In the year 2000, Archbishop Yong was succeeded by Archbishop Nicholas Chia, who continued to strengthen the organization of the church. Greater emphasis was given to humanitarian and missionary efforts, which led to the establishment of Caritas in 2006. To cater to the growing number of Catholics in Singapore, churches such as St. Mary of the Angels, St. Vincent de Paul, Risen Christ, Holy Trinity, and Divine Mercy were built. In 2013, Father William Goh was ordained Archbishop, and today, as our spiritual father, he holds up the light with us. Today, there are a total of 31 parishes around the island with plans to build a new church to serve the Congo and Sinkan community. The church started with people who made great sacrifices. They did not have the resources, the modern technology. There was no electricity. There were no fans. There was no sound system in the church. That's why you have all these tall uh, pulpits in the church. The priest stood right up there and he had to blast the gospel. I feel that it is good to know the hardship and the trials that the early missionaries went through in building this church. And that's why the younger generation of Catholics should be more ready to make sacrifices for the glory of God. If you have only one life, then how are you going to make the difference? This third millennium is the millennium of the laity be part of it and write history for the next 50 years. In today's Singapore, we are called more than ever to bring light to this world, to serve others with the light of Christ. Let us pray. Lord God, we turn to you and put into your hands of love the people that you have brought together here in Singapore. With your light burning in our hearts, send your Holy Spirit powerfully upon your young ones, the littlest ones who have yet to know you. We thank you for having blessed the people of Singapore over the last 50 years. Thank you for the many missionaries who came to bring your light to all the people here. We thank you for the local vocations that you have given us, and we ask you to bless them that the work that we have started in Singapore will continue to progress. That everybody here in Singapore will be what he intends us to be. United, peaceful, loving. May the church continue to be a beacon of light and hope. And as we celebrate 50 years of nationhood, reward all those who have done much for our country. Ask for the Spirit to be present, especially among the young people. They will be the pillars of the future church. Guide us in Singapore to be a more compassionate society. Lord, we pray especially for the next uh, 50 years that you might bless each and every citizen and each and every family. Help us to realise that only love can be our motivation. Take us off our comfort zone and help us to go towards each other. Enable us to desire more and more to be of service and love to all whom we meet. Bless our nation, in particular our leaders and all who are involved to build up our nation. We ask you to continue to send us 
good people so that whatever we do, O oh God, will be in your name, for your love, and for your greater glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and, and to, to the, the Holy Spirit, Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen.